So we've spoken about centrifugation so far. In terms of centrifuges that we can find in a research lab. But what if we know the principles of centrifugation and we want to think how can we make one from scratch? And we can can we make one that is then capable of being cheap and yet doing our job? Now, sometimes this is a contradiction, right? If you make it very cheap, then it doesn't have the features that the complex one has. And this is the theme that Saad Bhamla and company attempted to address in their paper in Nature Biomedical Engineering. This paper is titled Hand Powered Ultra Low Cost Paper Centrifuge. And we are going to review it. We are going to discuss it in the context of the limitations and advantages of such an approach. They claim that their paper fuge or paper powered, hand powered paper centrifuge, because the key part, the rotating rotor is made of paper, can achieve 1.25 lakh RPM approximately 30,000 G and a upper limit of 1 million or 10 lakh RPM is maximally achievable according to them. They in fact managed to separate plasma in 1.5 minutes. Let's see the evidence. So conventional laboratory centrifuges have complex electronics. They have a electric motor usually that drives the mechanics, the rotors, spindle, ball bearings, lots of engineering goes into it. They're also at times capable of having thermal components with either cooling or heating or both because sometimes your sample is thermolabile or thermostable only at a certain specific temperature and being able to control this is important which is why a good research lab has a good centrifuge at least. Modern centrifuges are also computer controlled with programmable interfaces. They may even be intelligent. They will give you a warning. They will alert you when things go wrong, like for example, tubes are not balanced and so on and so forth. But all these things are not always available. And many of you may be in colleges that are watching this, and maybe you know that these kind of centrifuges are not available in your college. And it's a bit of a pity, but that's how it is. But when we go to medical diagnostics, it turns out that for infectious diseases, to run laboratory-based tests of reasonable sensitivity and specificity, we need microscopy and centrifugation. Now, not all these devices are available in peripheral health centers, in remote areas, even in India. You can see that there is a big difference <clears throat> between urban and rural and even within urban areas there will be parts of the city which do not have very good facilities for health and parts that do. So to tackle this difference we need both equipment and training as well as supervision because the disease burden of malaria, TB, dengue, HIV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, giardia and bacterial infections is so high in countries like ours that something needs to be done. And this is reviewed by Mabe et al. in Nature Microbiology and Urdia et al. in Nature. The paradox is that these devices are commercial. You can buy them. But that means the primary health care center needs money to buy them, which means they need a budget, which means they need somebody to pay for it. Now, not everyone has the money. Not every country has the budget for it. Not every country has the plan to put diagnostic centers everywhere. This is a tragedy for humanity. And scientists like Amla et al, they decided to make a low cost centrifuge costing only rupees 15 in terms of parts, weighing only two grams and made in such a way that it is portable and robust. They in fact used it as a platform based on a toy, a do-it-yourself toy. So the video demonstration I'm going to show you is about exactly this toy. I took a cardboard piece. So I tried to mimic what they did. Took scissors, thread, pen, and something circular. I marked a circular pattern on the cardboard piece, cut it. 
smoothed the edges of the cut with a scissor. And then with a scale or a ruler, I made lines along the diameter so as to find the approximate center. Once I had the center, initially I got some wrong centers. I marked two holes set up, separated by two centimeters using a compass and inserted thread through it. That was my basic toy. And I tied it up. Now I have my basic toy. But this basic toy can be made a bit more sophisticated as the people in the paper have described. And I've made a version of it which you can see now. So this is a small mimic of the paper fuge that we have made with the handles made out of PVC pipe, nylon thread, fishing thread, can you see it in focus now, and a disc that is made out of a cap of a petri dish, uh, ATM petri dish, and we have marked the two centers as we had described in the description earlier. And you will notice that this is surprisingly capable of working quite well. So you need a little bit of practice. You need to torque it. And you will find that this expansion and contraction motion gives you quite high RPMs and I don't know if you can hear it, but this is really fast. According to the calculations in the paper, they can at times even reach 10,000 RPM. And that's astounding. Now, all this motion, what is it for? Let's see. So as it turns out, when they used a high-speed camera, what I have here is a normal uh, 40 frames per second camera. They used 6,000 frames per second camera. And they could see what you saw already, maybe by eye, that the thread can supercoil. And the orientation of winding and unwinding is opposite. Meaning to say that when it's winding up, the rotation goes one direction, clockwise you say. And when you unwind it, it goes in the opposite direction. The force that is exerted is usually to unwind because as you noticed that my device compresses when I am trying to let the supercoiling take over. This is the part which they refer in the paper to as winding up and the pulling apart is called unwinding which leads to rotation in the other direction. That momentum or you may say inertia results in it over torquing and going in the other direction leading to again supercoiling and the cycle goes on. They also found that the disc radius if it's very small the angular velocity is very high and as the disc radius increases you get lower angular velocity. Now think about this for a second that if you are trying to centrifuge a tube let's say Eppendorf tube or these micro centrifuge tubes then you want at least a minimum disc radius because if you don't have it then you are unlikely to be able to make this any use of make you any use of it correct but on the other hand you also want it to go fast for the applications you're looking for so the maximal rpm that they could observe was one lakh rpm that's a lot that's a lot by the way and you can go back if you have access to a laboratory or when you go back to your laboratories in school or college, you can take a look at this. In their paper, they demonstrated using a force transduction device that the pulling force, the unwinding force, is in the range of about 75 newtons. The part where there is a drop in the force is also a part corresponding to the winding phase. That winding phase leads to slightly slower rotations and a switch to the other direction. This is what I was referring to. So what you're looking at in the two graphs, upper and lower, are force and the corresponding RPM for the same time 
series. The interesting part of this is that they also developed a theoretical model of the physics of torque, of the thread, of the viscous drag that the centrifuge experiences as it moves through this fluid of air. And finally, the motion itself, which is driven by the behavior of the user. So if we look at their paper, they are describing T input, that is the behavior of the user, the twist due to the thread, and T drag, tau drag. These are the three torques that they are interested in. The radius of winding, radius of the hands, and the theta angle of formed by the hand, the thread, and the hands are considered to be important. So, twist, drag, and input. Now, what they also do is they test whether the experimental data of rotation, disk radius and force match with each other. And as you can see in this surface deck graph, they appear to indeed match. As with a lot of theory, you can calculate a lot theoretically once you have the equations, but experiments are harder to do. But in this sort of empirical approach, it's very important to know if theory and experiment match. That is also the case in the force angular rotations and two theta degree measures, where they all qualitatively follow the same behavior as the experiment. The circles are the experiments, the black lines are the theory. So, what did they use it for? I said this earlier that it depends on the application. In their case, they followed the hematocrit. Now, you remember I have spoken quite a bit about hematology and very basic, very simple elementary medical tests that are conducted when you go to do a blood test. Hematocrit is something that is a very old fashioned measure because you take a hematocrit tube, pinprick the person, get a capillary bleed. Place the tube either in a centrifuge, in specialized hematocrit centrifuge, and spin it and measure the percentage of the red blood cell layer to the total amount of the height of the blood column. Naturally, this process must involve heparinized or citrated blood to prevent clotting. So, when you take the blood like this, it has to be already containing citrate the amount of citrate added is constant so that you don't make a make a it doesn't make a difference to your calculations of hematocrit anyway these are relative measures so relative to the total volume is all you're interested in but you can imagine that if you put too much citrate you will change numbers the tubes are placed in the holders along the radius of the paper fuge and the adapters are straws like sucking straws a second sheet, the, remember we said that the published report talks about two paper sheets, is used to protect the blood and the hematocrit tube. They use plastic tubes to prevent breakage and damage and injury to the user, and they use the straws to prevent spillage. All of them are sealed at one end using acrylic adhesive. What they found is that hematocrit and plasma separated in 1.5 minutes. That is amazing because typically in experimental work, this takes about two minutes. So it is very comparable. Now, of course, they optimize the conditions, and this is important in any kind of experimental approach to find the best situation that works. And they also went ahead to use a demonstration to check whether the Buffy coat can be obtained from this paper centrifuge for diagnosing malaria. And they did this using a QBC quantitative Buffy coat tube. 
which is already pre-coated on the inside with acridine orange. Acridine orange is a DNA staining dye, the O as it is referred to here. The citrated blood is introduced into the tube. A little plastic floater is added into it that spreads the buffy layer, therefore giving you bigger resolution because otherwise the buffy layer is very small. Buffy layer usually includes white blood cells. Buffy coat. And the cells were centrifuged using the paper field. Initially, as you see over here in the left corner, the float drops down because of centrifugation, but then because of density, it reaches a equilibrium position and spreads the buffy coat. The bright red color is RBC as you expect. The platelets, lymphocytes, and monocytes and granulocytes are spread in the upper thin layer and plasma layer is on top of it. The float is the one that separates the plasma and the buffy coat. In comparative studies between the quantitative buffy coat method and the gem sustained thick film, that is GTF method, it was found that QBC is much less sensitive, meaning to say the lowest number of parasites that can be detected using QBC is only 56% compared to the gold standard, which is GEMSA thick stain. Stain thicker. The specificity, on the other hand, meaning if there is something, you will find it and you can distinguish it from other parasites, let's say malaria from dengue, is 95%. This is based on studies by Adeo and Nga in Parasitology International and Mark Norman, Norman Zach and Chang in 1992 from Journal of Singapore Medicine. So in summary, we can say that the paperfuge is a wonderful do-it-yourself laboratory centrifuge for low-cost separation. It has very specific advantages that relate to the applications that it was used for, making it a possible additional tool for diagnostics, especially in low resource settings, meaning when there's less funding available for basic clinical diagnostics. But it's also limited in terms of the application because it has not been demonstrated on others. So if you would like to try this, this is something that you can easily do in a small school or college laboratory. And future improvements are definitely possible through 3D printing and intermediates between electric and hard wound, hand wound machines. So we stop here and we'll continue on some problems. <laughs>